and get started. Um, first of all, good evening and welcome to tonight's webinar, Navigating COVID-19 Federal Aid for Specialty Crop Farmers. My name is Natalie Fullerton. I am the Assistant Director here at the Kansas Rural Center, and I want to thank you for joining the webinar tonight and taking the time to, to learn with us. Like many of you, KRC has had to pivot to more online platforms for information and resource sharing. And while we always love our in-person events, we're really excited to be able to share uh, this presentation with you tonight on this webinar and as well a video farm tour. So uh, we think that's pretty exciting that we're able to do that. Um, but first, before we jump into that, I want to share a little bit of information about the Kansas Rural Center for those who may not be as familiar with our organization. Um, KRC for the past 40 years has worked to promote the long-term health of land and its people through research, education, and advocacy. And we do this several ways. Uh, first, we monitor uh, state and federal level food and farm policy. Many of you maybe receive our policy watch, our weekly publication during the, legisla the legislative session. That's one example. We also do the practical hands-on type of information workshops and resource sharing, much like uh, we're doing with this webinar tonight. So through all of this, KRC is very committed to an economically viable, environmentally sound, and socially responsible agriculture and rural culture. This webinar tonight is organized as part of KRC's risk management for Specialty Crop Growers Project, which has focused mostly for the past couple of years on business and financial strategies, tools, uh, crop insurance, as well as other USDA programs that are available to uh, specialty crop growers. So tonight's webinar is actually the last in our, in our series. Uh, last week, we held a food safety webinar, um, and earlier this week, we held a marketing and record-keeping webinar. Tom Buller with K-State Research and Extension uh, helped host the record-keeping workshop last night. Um, all of these webinars are recorded and getting linked up on our website. Uh, you can already find the food safety webinar linked up there and the marketing record keeping and this webinar tonight will be linked there as well. So um, if you didn't catch the other webinars and would like to, uh, you'll be able to find those on our website. I also just wanna share that KRC has this COVID-19 resource page on our website. We keep this fairly updated and feel like it's a really good comprehensive list of all of the uh, resources and information you might be looking for right now. So feel free to check that out if you need information. If you visit the website and find you're not getting what you need, give us a nudge. Uh, we can uh, both try to help track down the information you need and update the website to include uh, that information so it's uh, helpful for everybody. All right, so for tonight's webinar, we have two really exciting things. We have a first a video farm tour of a &H Farm near Manhattan, Kansas. And this is uh, really relative for tonight's topic because a &H Farm has received uh, or did receive a Farmers to Family Food Box Program contract and has been working to grow produce and procure food to feed families across the Midwest through this, this food box program. So we'll learn a little bit more about that, um, what that looks like at A&H Farm tonight in their farm video. Um, just a little bit about that Farmers to Family Food Box program for those who might not be as familiar. It is a program um, of the CARES Act that has allowed the USDA to contract with uh, national and local suppliers, including farms, uh, distributors and other food businesses. And so these suppliers are able to package food products into boxes that feed families for about up to a week. And those are transported to um, 
food banks, community and faith-based organizations, and other nonprofits serving those in need. So as of today, I looked and it looks like that over 20 million food boxes have been distributed, um, which is great because it's not only helping feeding people, but um, it's helping farms like A&H Farm. So we really hope that this program can continue to help families in need, but also our, our local farms. So then following uh, the farm tour, we have a presentation um, by farm Sarah from Farm Commons, and she's going to help guide us through some of the options available in the CARES Act and um, some things that you might need to know or consider if you have already applied or are going to be applying. So that's what we have tonight. Um, we will have some time at the end for questions. Andrea uh, with a &H Farm uh, will hopefully be joining us a little bit later in the webinar, um, but she has a farmer's market tonight, so there is the possibility she may not be able to jump on. However, if you have questions for Andrea, feel free to um, ask those questions in the chat box and I'll be sure to get them answered for you. Um, along the line of questions, uh, please use the chat box in the lower center of your screen to ask questions. Feel free to um, enter those questions at any point during the webinar and we'll uh, look at those at the end when we have some time for, for Q&A. So, all right, without further ado, I will go ahead and pull up the farm video. Give me one second here to get that pulled up. All right, and here we go. Good afternoon. This is Andrea with AH Farm, and I'll be taking you on a tour of various um, things on our farm. We are located just south of Manhattan, um, off of Manhattan Avenue. Um, this is our 10th year doing a fall festival. I grew up with fruits and vegetables. I moved away for a little while for the military and came back in 2008 and have been doing doing this ever since. Um, we are heavy into agritourism. We do fruits and vegetables. And we've made some changes this year. Um, this parking lot is empty right now. But on Thursday nights, we do a drive-through pickup. Um, we started this back in mid-April. We call it our chop boxes. And it was received um, very, very well. It's a combination of homegrown items as well as produce that we purchase in. Um, we did not have enough in April. We had we had asparagus is about all we had, and that wasn't enough for consumers to make the trip out, but we added some items that we didn't grow. Demand was astronomical, and they have been super, super popular. So we will take you on a tour this evening and hope you enjoy. This here is one of our high tunnels. Uh, we have three total, they are 30 by 96, and we are looking at putting up uh, two more as well. This one here we have tomatoes, and we will be putting late tomatoes in our other two high tunnels. Um, we've done cucumbers, we've done zucchini, um, but this year we had went with tomatoes in these. Um, previously we'd done an eight row in here, but we found it was a little too crowded, so we went for a six row this year to kind of test that out. Um, and so far I'm thinking that maybe a seven row would be a little better, but still determining what we like best and the width on those, so. This spring we planted apple trees. Um, we're doing a high density apple orchard. We have uh, two runs here, 600 foot long. Um, started just with 100 trees of each variety. We have Fuji, Gala, uh, Evercrisp, and then a Golden Delicious type. So started small, but that is something we're going to be offering you pick in the future. I'm hoping to do all you pick. Um, I'm trying to get more and more to that. Um, and right next to that, we have our asparagus. We've done Purple Passion for years. Um, and then last year we planted 
and a lot more green and had hoped to open for you pick asparagus in 2020 but due to the covid we did not do you pick asparagus for 2020 um, but that is now on the list for 2021 to do you pick asparagus one of the things that we've shifted to recently or in the last few years is we've gotten a lot more into agritourism um, one of the things that we offer on our farm is a petting zoo. Um, so in the spring we do a baby animal festival. Um, we had planned a breakfast with the Easter Bunny this spring. Um, we do an adult Easter egg hunt. Um, all kinds of activities for consumers to come out to the farm. Um, as I had mentioned, we do uh, want to do you pick asparagus and we would tie into our activities as well. So one of the things that we had built for this season was a new petting zoo um, where we allow consumers actually in to visit with our animals as well as doing some of the other new pick options and visiting the farm as another form of education here. One of the things we've got here is donkeys on our farm and you can see the little pigs too, they get out um, and run. They were in the petting zoo but get out and the donkeys we have around the petting zoo here. So that's one of the things that we offer as part of the agritourism is they can come out and visit the animals. And consumers seem to really like that. Um, they don't have that capability um, even before the COVID to come out and visit with the animals. Um, so that's one of the things that we like to provide for them. One of the you pick crops that we offer is you pick strawberries. Um, it's now June 20, third um, and we are done with you pick we finished early June um, late freeze in April really hurt us this year um, but we will be using this plastic for we'll put squash behind it whether it be a pie pumpkins or butternut acorn spaghetti we'll put something in here we might put zucchini in here um, so we've actually sprayed this field um, we spray it with roundup we wait a few days and then we will put paraquat on it to finish it off. Um, even then we struggle, the strawberries still want to come back, but that usually is enough to get the squash up and going pretty good. And it allows us to reuse the plastic and we also have drip tape underneath it so we can fertilize that way. Um, gets us a little more bang for our buck on the plastic there. So we like to double use those. Use that right there as well. Um, this was our sunflower field last year, so we put the strawberries in the first of September, Strawber sunflowers were done. Our sunflowers this year are in this area right here. We've actually expanded the size. Um, we do sunflower festival, and I believe this year it's going to be even bigger um, due to demand. Um, everything we've had this year, the demand is just overwhelming with the COVID and I, I see that in the foreseeable future as well, especially with recent spikes as well, it's going to continue to increase. Um, here on the north side of me is our sweet corn. So we have multiple blocks of sweet corn as well. And that there, once we're done picking the sweet corn, we will actually um, bale it and, har um, and feed it for cows for winter, or sometimes we'll turn the cows out to the actual field itself and graze as well, since I do have some of my cattle on the farm throughout the season. So that's a few more of the crops that we have here. Um, this area here is our pumpkin field. It was planted on Sunday. And today is Tuesday. I get turned around on my days. Got so much going on here. Um, we do a you pick pumpkin patch, um, so primarily all retail. Um, we do jack o' lanterns, we do pie pumpkins, uh, we do what I call a specialty or Martha mix, um, gourds, um, all kinds of edible pumpkins as well. Um, we have it set up where we actually do a hay rack ride out to the field and customers can pick their pumpkins right off the vine. Um, we also pick and then put in our storefront as well. But the demand is we're seeing increase in the past years is they want to come out to the field and pick. Um, it's even more evident this year with the COVID. Um, in the background there, you can see tractor. Uh, we're swathing alfalfa as well. Um, a small field that we have back there that we had planted last year. Uh, we are a very diverse farm. Um, we do the fruits and vegetables, agritourism, row crops, all kinds of different things. I'm always trying new stuff. Um, here we have watermelons. Um, we do the black plastic as well. 
uh, watermelons here as well and then we have we'll get some more close-ups of our squashes and tomatoes and stuff on that side as well one of the things that you've probably seen in some of these videos is these white pop posts sticking up here um, those are irrigation risers we put in irrigation a couple years ago and we use a micro rain um, like this here which we extend out through our rows and waters and it's just the pressure pulls it back in itself self not self-propelling but it reels itself in so I'm not sure the exact terminology on that we also use drip on some things and year by year what we put drip on and what we don't so like our watermelons we do not have drip on but we have some on our tomatoes and our pepper plants things like that so it just varies year by year exactly what we put where we put it and if we drip it or not but that is one of our forms of irrigation uh, here's some more rows that we have. This is some winter squash here. Um, we planted some of that early um, due to demand. And then as part of our farmers to families food boxes, um, we thought if we were awarded that contract, that would be some good items to put in there. I've never planted it this early. Um, it's looking great right now. We're going to see how it sets. Um, there are blooms on it now. but something new to try this early. normally I'm just planting it about this time but these are fully mature plants getting ready to set so excited to see how that works um, we have peppers right here next to them um, getting close um, there's some sweet bananas right in there not quite ready but won't be long with this heat um, looking pretty good right now uh, these like I said we do have set up on drip we are a very sandy soil out here um, and that's one of the things I find is my pepper plants are lacking late in the season they need more fertilizer I just can't give them enough granular underneath the plastic so we've set those up with drip this year so that I can do fertigation as well um, tomato plants um, we have them here we did have some loss this year um, we had put a spray on them and then we got some cold and wet weather and actually lost a fair amount of our plants but the ones that are making it are doing phenomenal uh, we're actually doing a set second set of tie on them right now but we will have those before long as well one of the row crops that we have planted this year is wheat so this whole you know about 50 acres there of wheat um, that need to get harvested it's pretty close to ready if not ready um, so that's on the to-do list as well as to get that harvested um, the plan is to put milo behind that um, last year that's where we had sweet corn and pumpkins and tomatoes and watermelon and cantaloupe a lot of our fruits and vegetables were over there so we're taking it out of fruit and vegetable production for at least one year if not longer um, we do try and rotate quite a bit to help with the spread of disease and things like that this is Andrea with ANH Farm and we are working on the farmers to families food boxes here this afternoon and I'm going to give you a little quick tour of how this looks when we're in full swing here doing boxes um, we are shipping out a load to Oklahoma that goes out tonight to arrive there tomorrow we're going to Colorado we go across Kansas school districts churches um, all kinds of different things so let me flip it around here so the boxes at the end of the line we put on the lighter stuff such as the jalapenos and the fruit so we have oranges going in there apples um, this week we actually put in a three pound bag of apples um, we have carrots in here we have onions and we have some red onions as well and then at that end we have sweet potatoes and we have potatoes as well so a wide variety of stuff um, we try and aim for enough to feed a family of four for about a week um, but it's about 20 plus pounds of produce um, we are getting a custom box in that we are using um, from a company out of Kansas City so it's helping them as well um, and it's a fold-up box like that right there that we put together and stack those up so that kind of gives you an idea of how that process goes and when we're running on full steam um, we can get a pallet done about every 15 minutes so he pulls that off right there um, and then it will be wrapped and the truck will be out so usually we pack and send out the same day um, some of our school districts that take smaller amounts we deliver to as well some pick up and then we work with them on what works best for them
All right. Um, I think uh, uh, Andrea really wished she could have been here uh, earlier tonight, but as I mentioned earlier, she is hoping to join the webinar um, a little bit later tonight. So if you do have questions about Andrea's farm tour, feel free to go ahead and put those in the chat. And regardless, we will get those questions to her and get them answered for you. So with that, I'm going to go ahead and turn things over to Sarah. Great. Thank you, Natalie. I'm just making sure that my screen is able to be seen right now. So let me just get this where it needs to go. All right, and I think we're good. Maybe. All right. Well, hi everyone. My name is Sarah Vale, and I'm a staff attorney with the nonprofit organization Farm Commons, as Natalie mentioned. And thank you so much, Natalie and the Candace Rural Center for asking me to be a part of this this evening. So I'm really excited to share with you what I've been learning all these past COVID months. Uh, we've been assisting farmers here at Farm Commons across the nation with understanding all these new laws that have been introduced in direct response to COVID-19. So as part of our 45 or so minutes together, um, I have for talking with you, I'll be sharing what I know about federal level COVID-19 assistance that specialty crop farmers can take advantage of. So I'll let you know what options you have and how to navigate aid, whether you're applying for one of those programs for the first time, or you've already received some of this financial aid. So first, before we dig into it, just a little bit about Farm Commons. If you don't know about us yet, uh, our mission is to empower farmers to resolve their own legal vulnerabilities within a community of support. How do we do this? We deliver workshops all across the country, or at least we did before COVID-19. Um, we do this together with farmer co-presenters who we train up in farm law, and then we turn around to pass along this knowledge. They turn around to pass this knowledge along in their own communities. And we also do this for farmers and farm service providers. So two different types of workshops we hold. We also produce a ton of educational materials for farmers and those who work with farmers, which are also all available for free on our website. We have print guides, long and short, uh, podcasts, webinars, like the one we're presenting today. We're also able to offer technical support around navigating the confusing twists and turns of the law to farm service organizations. Things for, uh, for us, like most of all of you, have really shifted since COVID-19 and that now we're working really hard to respond to the emergency this pandemic presents for the farming community. So we're doing that by reviewing and analyzing all the pieces of legislation that come down the pipeline and then presenting it to our farm audience in a way that hopefully makes sense and is digestible and actionable. So if you need more information about COVID-19 resources, we have a podcast channel. We also have our website. We have COVID-19 specific resources available there. It's all at farmcommons.org. So our roadmap here for the next, well, 40 minutes or so is um, we are going to be talking about all these acronyms here. So these programs are likely familiar to you, as are the acronyms, but for a little refresher, here's the list of the federal programs I'll cover in our short time today. So first I'll get into the PPP, that stands for Paycheck Protection Program, which many of you probably know about already. But if you don't, that program was the first big federal financial relief program available for farmers, and we'll talk about what it entails and how to apply if you haven't done so and how to seek forgiveness for your loan if you are one of the lucky ones to have received one already. And then we'll turn to the EIDL or Economic Injury Disaster Loans, which as we'll get into is not just a loan program, but also a grant program. And the exciting part about this program is that whereas farmers are not, we're not eligible before, they are now, and that is a flexible spending program. So you'll want to know about that one. Uh, then we'll move on to CFAP. So what's that? That's the Coronavirus Food Assistance Program. And in that program, farmers can get direct payments from the federal government for losing money on their crops. 
Um, then we go into the PUA, that's the Pandemic Unemployment Assistance Program. Helpful if you are out of a job or your employees are out of a job. Big, expensive, unemployment, expansive rather, unemployment program, which is helping a lot of small business owners right now. And lastly, we'll touch upon the FFCRA, that's the Families First Coronavirus Response Act. This one is where you can get assistance from the feds to pay your workers to stay home because they're sick. So let's dig in. Okay, so the PPP or Paycheck Protection Program. This program is designed to help you keep your workers on payroll. So it's to help them continue get, to get their paychecks. It's available for small businesses, so those with less than 500 employees, and is very much available to specialty crop growers like you, who probably, I'm guessing, have less than 500 employees. In this program, you don't have to show the government that you are necessarily hurting. In other words, the application doesn't ask you to show reduced revenue. So it feels very flexible in that way. But on the other hand, the uses for this money is very restrictive. So basically, you're going to ask the government to pay you for about two and a half months worth of payroll expenses. And then you are required to spend this money mostly on payroll. You are allowed to spend the rest of the money on non-payroll expenses, but even this is limited to mortgage, interest payments, rent, and utilities. So again, the whole idea behind PPP is that you are being paid to keep your workers on payroll. So this doesn't actually mean that your workers have to work. For example, you can bring your workers on payroll, but then they can just stay home. Why would you do this? I'm not quite sure, but I suppose because some of the money you can spend to cover your other basic expenses, so that's helpful. And free money from the government, why not? Plus, you're helping your employees, and hopefully this means that they stay with you through the bad times and are free to work again during the good times. But most likely, on fruit and vegetable farms, there's always work to do, so paying workers to just stay home is probably not likely. The PPP program sounds kind of like a dream, right? You get free money from the feds with strings attached, sure, but as long as you play your cards right, you don't have to pay it back. Very exciting. So it's not really a loan then, it's a grant. Feels like, hey, we won the lottery, or have we? PPP has gotten a lot of criticism regarding its forgivability. Is it really truly forgivable? Well, yes it is if you follow very strict guidelines and you have an accountant and possibly a lawyer on deck to help you figure out the forgiveness application. Critics have been saying it's nearly impossible to get it forgiven and to actually understand how to apply without an advanced degree. Well, luckily, Congress listened to reason and responded recently with legislation relaxing these onerous forgiveness requirements. So let's get into these changes. One change is that before you had to hire back all of your workers, uh, before you had to hire back all of your workers, now if you can show that due to a government stay at home order, you couldn't hire them back because say you couldn't open the store, you can't sell your product, you can still get forgiveness. Also, before you had only until June 30th to hire back your workers and now you have until the end of the year. And if you can't hire your workers due to a COVID-related government restriction, you may still be able to get your loan forgiven. I think I mentioned that one already. Another change is before you had eight weeks, now you have a whole 24 weeks to spend the money. And before you had to pay that loan back, if you didn't get it forgiven, um, it would be in two years. And now you have an entire five years to get that paid back. So, and another final uh, relaxation measure is that you now have 10 months from when you spent the last dime of that PPP to ask for forgiveness. So before you had to ask for forgiveness basically right away. So the rules are a lot better now. If you haven't yet applied for PPP, don't worry, you still can, but not for much longer at all. You only have until June 30th, which is coming right up. So as of Tuesday, there was about $128 billion still left. So this is definitely still an opportunity available to you. It's a very, very tiny window, but it is still open. 
So here's how you apply. You're going to go to your local bank. You can also go to the SBA website to locate local lenders if you're not sure who to go to. If you've applied and you are ready to seek forgiveness, you can see the application on the SBA website. And if you want to learn more about the PPP program, including the new forgiveness information, you can see a Farm Commons webinar that's dedicated to that very issue. So you can go to farmcommons.org, create an account in five minutes or less, and you'll have access to that webinar and all of our other resources. So the EIDL, that is the Economic Injury and Disaster Loans Program. That's the next program we'll go over here. So this program lets small businesses apply for loans up to $2 million with an interest rate of 3.75% over 30 years, where they are experiencing decreased revenue due to you guessed it, economic injury or a disaster. Basically, the new legislation from the CARES Act, which also created the PPP program, took the existing EIDL program and made it applicable to everyone. That's right, because in all 50 states have now been declared disaster areas, so anyone in any state is now eligible to receive funding if they can show that their revenues have decreased due to COVID-19. So this differs from PPP and that you do have to make a showing in your application that you are suffering economically. However, unlike PPP, you have pretty much total flexibility for how you use the funds. You can use the funds for payroll or you can use them for whatever business related expenses under the sun you have. But also unlike PPP, sorry, you have to pay it back. Sure, it's low interest over a long period of time, but you still have to pay it back. But, wait, there is a but. There is another aspect to this program, and that's the grant program. So, that's right. You can, in theory, apply for up to a $10,000 grant under this program, and that's an emergency grant, so you're supposed to get it within three days of applying. Now, this part, you can still use for just about anything, and of course, you don't have to pay it back. You just have to show that your business is a total financial mess. Not hard these days for many businesses, right? The total bummer part of the EIDL program was that when it first was unveiled, farmers got very excited and started applying only to find out that they weren't actually invited to the party. Due to a strange amendment to the EIDL program back in maybe the 1980s or so, the Small Business Administration said farmers couldn't go through their agency and get EIDL loans and grants. They could just go to USDA and use their disaster assistance programs. But the SBA saw the error of their ways after an extremely and wonderfully outspoken choir of farmers and farmer advocates who said, this is not okay. Farmers need access to these funds too. And they passed an amendment to this program and now. Since the end of, far of April, farmers and only farmers were allowed to apply for EIDL funds. So now um, it's, it's open to everyone at this point, but the potentially sad part um, about excluding farmers at first is that I think a lot of farmers um, believe that they are not eligible. So there's still a lot of money available. You can go online to the SBA website and Get yourself some EIDL funds. And yes, we have a webinar specifically on the EIDL program. So on to CFAP. So much hype, so much letdown. CFAP is the Coronavirus Food Assistance Program. And this is a long awaited allocation of money that the government set aside in the CARES Act for farmers. The language of the bill made it sound like it was going to be focused on specialty crop growers, direct to market producers, and other producers selling into local markets. However, the reality has been much different. Basically, $16 billion became available on May 26th for farmers to apply to receive direct payments for financial losses incurred due to COVID-19. However, these payments are unlikely to be that helpful for specialty crop growers who generally, of course, receive a premium for their products. So this program is really geared towards the commodity grower selling one or two crops, not the diversified farmer selling multiple specialty crops. So basically, 
under this program, the government will pay farmers a set price for losses incurred because the price of the product decreased or there was no market for the products at all and the products spoiled. So the farmers will be paid a set rate for each eligible product. So is it worth it if you're a specialty crop grower? I said probably not, but let's just see. So specialty crops, producers who grow fruits, vegetables, and nuts may be eligible for CFAP if they had any crops that meet the following conditions. They produce produce grown this year that suffered at least a 5% price decline. Produce shipped but subsequently spoiled due to loss of a marketing channel. So this applies to farmers who have met contractual obligations in delivering a crop to the buyer but have not been paid. Crops that were not able to be sold due to loss of marketing channel and were either unharvested or plowed under or were not shipped. You can see the full list of eligible specialty crops at the USDA CFAP website. And I think that Natalie's putting uh, in the chat box a link to that. She's also been putting in the chat box uh, some other links that you might find useful. Um, you can see a price calculator there. For example, say you grow organic blueberries. Well, according to this page on this website, blueberries are indeed an eligible specialty crop. And if those blueberries left the farm but spoiled due to loss of um, your marketing channel, the blueberry producer will receive a whopping 62 cents per pound for those blueberries. So that's quite a lot less than your organic blueberries are probably going to sell for. And that may not feel very worth it to you to apply for this program. So the answer is likely probably not, probably not worth it for specialty crop growers to apply for this program. But don't take my word for it. It may in fact be worthwhile for your operation and everyone should take a look. So say you are interested in applying, how do you do it? You can go directly to the USDA CFAP website where there is an application and Natalie is putting that here in the chat box. Uh, you can also call your local FSA office for a paper application. The application is a very simple form, but there is lots of documentation that must be submitted along with it. So documentation includes forms such as average adjusted gross income certification and consent to disclose tax information and farm operating plan for payment eligibility. The documentation that substantiates financial loss can be provided later. So you're going to have 60 days after submitting the application to get that in. So there's a bit of a break there. So specialty crop producers can substantiate losses with bills of sale for products that were sold or documentation such as a letter from the buyer explaining non-payment or other record validating non-payment for products that were shipped from the farm. The application process opened on May 26th and it will remain open until August 28th, but it is a first come first serve basis. So um, get in there if you think it's something you wanna do. As of this week, uh, there was about um, just two billion of the 16 billion allocated. So sounds like there's still quite a bit of money in the pot at this point. So the National Sustainable Agriculture Coalition is a great resource for CFAP information and is a great jumping off point for all the other places it directs you to get the info you need on this program. So Natalie again is putting the website in there in the chat box. So do um, start there if this is something you're thinking about. So on to our next program, the PUA, Pandemic Unemployment Assistance. Now think of this program as your safety net if you've explored all the other relief options and can't get any or if those simply don't work for you because there are no markets for your crops, no work to be done on the farm and you simply need to say, hey everyone, we can't pay you right now but the government can. Time to go on unemployment. So this unemployment program is like none other. So for the first time, workers who are self-employed can now get unemployment. Workers who still have jobs but fewer hours can get unemployment. Also, you don't just get the usual 50 or so percent of your usual earnings, but up through the end of July, 
the feds will kick in an additional $600 per week. So it's a good time to get unemployment. But the bad news, because nothing's always without its issues. PUA may feel like hitting the jackpot, but it's not an easy jackpot to find. There are many obstacles. Think about it. Every state unemployment office has now been asked to retrofit their programs they've been running for decades and now turn it into something completely new. With reduced staff who are probably working from home with crying babies and screaming children running amok. Applying for PUA is not easy. To say the least, I've heard horror stories from farmers and other small business owners about the number of times they've had to call to try to talk to an actual human, how their application has been rejected numerous times, how there is actually no box to check anywhere about being self-employed. The program was not made for non-traditional workers, but non-traditional workers and farmers who are included in the very definition of self-employed people in the Department of Labor guidelines are very much allowed and encouraged to apply. But don't worry, Farm Commons has produced a state-by-state -state guide to the application process and you can go on our website and access it under our COVID-19 resources that should help you uh, walk you through the process in whatever state you are in. Now on to our last program we'll talk about this evening, FFCRA. This stands for the Families First Coronavirus Response Act. And one of the big things this act did was create a program where employees have the right to take sick leave and also family leave for COVID related reasons. And you, the employer, have to pay them to do this. This sounds like a bummer if you're the employer, right? You may wonder, how is this a farmer relief program again? Well, because the government will pay you back for paying your workers. And let's go through how this works. Probably your first question is, does this apply to me? The answer is a solid yes. If you employ less than 500 workers, this applies. There is a small exception, of course, and we'll get to that. Okay, so most farms are going to have less than 500 employees and will have to follow this law. What do I have to do? You're likely thinking now. You have to be prepared to provide up to either two weeks of paid sick leave or up to three months of paid family leave, depending on the number of factors. And we'll get into those factors now. Let's talk about the sick leave part of the law. All employees, no matter if they've worked for you a year or even a day or a single hour, have the right to be paid for 80 hours. Basically, two weeks to take leave for one of the six listed reasons related to COVID-19. The reasons are grouped into two categories. So the first category is that you have or suspect you have COVID or are quarantined due to potential exposure to COVID. Say you just got off a cruise ship where everyone had COVID. It involves you yourself having COVID. The second category of reasons is that you are caring for someone else. Either they are your family and they have COVID or they are your kids and there's no school or daycare. So it's up to you to take care of them. If it's the first set of reasons due to yourself, the pay rate will be 100% of your normal pay rate, but is capped at $5,110. If it's the second set of reasons, someone else, it's two thirds of the normal rate, but capped at 2,000. If you provided healthcare benefits before leave, those must continue. The second aspect of the law is the paid family leave. So this allows employees to take extended leave from work for one reason and one reason only, to care for a child who is home due to their school or daycare closing. Employees in that situation can take 12 weeks off from work to provide that care, but note that only 10 weeks of those is going to be paid. Payment is two thirds of the normal pay, but capped at 10,000. Like with sick leave, any normal healthcare benefits are continued. Also, unlike the sick leave, family leave is not offered for workers who have not been employed for at least 30 days. So you might now be thinking that this is an onerous thing the government is telling me to do and that I can't possibly pay my workers not to work. But here's back to the good news. This is where the 
relief comes in. The government will be the one to pay your workers. So the idea is that you will take the money, you would pay the feds for all of your employment taxes, social security, Medicare, et cetera. And instead of paying the feds those taxes, you will use that money to pay your employees instead. And if you don't have this money set aside, you can ask the feds to give you the money up front. If you're still feeling like this is something you can't do, there's a narrow exception you may be able to take advantage of. If your employee is requesting leave to care for their child who is out of school or daycare due to COVID, you can claim that this will jeopardize the viability of your business and you just can't do it. You will have to document one of three available ways that your business will be jeopardized and be ready to argue this if called into question. We have done a full webinar at Farm Commons all about paid sick and family leave and have lots of resources on this. And so in our limited time today, I'll cover just the highlights, but do go to those resources if you need more information. And that brings me to the end of what I had for you here today. So now is the time for questions if you have any. Hey, thank you so much, Sarah. Um, yes, so we um, have quite a bit of time for questions. So if you have questions, feel free to type those in the chat box. Um, I, do, I do see that Andrea has been able to join us. Andrea, are you out there? I am, yes. Hey, Andrea, thanks for joining us. Um, we showed your farm tour video earlier. Um, do you want to just go ahead quickly while we're waiting for some questions to just chat a little bit about yourself and your farm and what you're up to tonight? Yes, I can. I'm actually at Farmer's Market this evening. Um, we started the season with barely getting one Farmer's Market off the ground, and now we are doing one on Saturday, one on Tuesday, one on Wednesday, one on Thursday. Um, demand has been extremely high with the COVID as well. So I am finishing up a farmer's market for the evening. It's a little warm, but looks like we got a cold front blowing in, so that makes it nice. Great. Well, thank you so much for um, carving out a few minutes to join us all this evening. Um, it looks like we do have a couple of questions coming in. Um, Tom is asking, uh, what is the process to get reimbursed for sick leave? So I believe this is for you, Sarah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, sure. Thanks, Tom. Um, good question. The process for getting reimbursed um, for sick leave is, uh, well, it really depends on um, what situation you're in. Do you need the money up front? In that case, you're going to seek an advance from the IRS. And that information, I don't have in available right in front of me here, but um, there's on the IRS, there is a, a web page dedicated to to this, and there's a information there about the application for the advance. And if you um, have the money in, so if you set it aside for taxes, say, so in your account, if you have set money aside for paying your, um, portion of the Medicare and Social Security and all those taxes that you'd ordinarily send to the government, then you just use those to pay your employees. So it really just depends on, on where you're at with that. Um, I know that in our Farm Commons, I hate to send you to another, yeah, another webinar or such, but we do have information about that. I know in our Farm Commons webinar about um, the sick leave program. If, you, if you're having a hard time finding that on the IRS webpage, you could always go to our website. Great, thanks, Sarah. Um, since we are a smaller group tonight, I believe we have made it possible. So if you, if you wanna go ahead and unmute yourself to ask questions, you sure can uh, do that. Um, and we have plenty of time yet, um, if you have, think of questions. Um, Andrea, we had a question earlier for you, actually. Um, I'm wondering if you can kind of talk through what the process looks like on your end. The question was regarding um, local produce that you're growing on your farm versus um, reselling or pro produce that you're 
purchasing to include in those food boxes. I think the question is kind of geared around um, uh, what does that look like uh, with the idea that folks want to support local farms, but there also might be some food that you need to purchase to uh, fulfill those boxes. Yes, are you asking for the farmers to family boxes or more my chop boxes that we started to doing, um, that we did to start the season with? Oh, yes, good question. I believe uh, the question was geared towards the farmers to families food box farmers programs. Families. Okay, um, once it was implemented, I think they announced like May 18th and then we were able to start shipping May 15th. Um, and we had some spring crops in the ground that we were able to use but what we had found is we didn't have enough for the demand was the first thing um, and second of all in some of the places that we're shipping they aren't capable of handling like the greens and things because everything has to go into the same box so we were putting potatoes in the same box as some of our greens and as you know cooler temperature needs to be different for those types of things to manage them the best so that's what we found is some of those items did not do well um, after we were awarded the first contract, we kind of took the risk and said, well, we hope we're going to get the second one and we planted a lot more so that we're able to put a lot more into the second round. And we did receive notification that we did, were awarded the second one. So we are utilizing more and more, or we'll be utilizing more and more homegrown items out there. Um, yes, Tom, I am still looking for more locations. Um, I do have a max amount. Um, that I can do, but I don't have anybody set in stone for the next session um, of who I'm going to distribute them to. Um, it just varies. I, what I tell people is to email me, um, email me their information. I have to have a 501c from them and they can email me and I work with each one individually. Um, and it's, don't be afraid to tell them the squeaky wheel gets the carrot because I'm, I get, I get so many phone calls and, and it's not just the people wanting the boxes, it's people wanting to sell their product and from across the nation. Um, I think the worst thing I ever did was put my cell phone number out there, um, for that because I get so many phone calls. So yeah, feel free. If I don't get back to them to have them email me again. Um, and that's the best way. Um, and Nancy, I, I, I saw part of your question, but I didn't see all of it. Something about buying produce. I don't know you can see that one, Natalie. Um, yeah, so Nancy says uh, you had to buy stuff, oranges and onions uh, that aren't homegrown. Yes, we had to buy in stuff from the original one. Um, in my agreement with them, I put in that we would have nine to 11 items in there. So we did purchase, especially for the first one, um, because like I said, it was a we, we applied for it on a Friday. I think it was announced the next Friday, and then the next Friday we were ready to start, or they wanted us to be ready to start shipping. So there was no way to get anything planted, and it was early in the season here as well. Um, so we did have to get stuff in, but as we're going through our season, more and more of it's homegrown or from farmers, or either homegrown by me, homegrown by other farmers in the area as well. Right, that makes sense, uh, just lining up with the season and everything. Yes, and um, we have planted super heavy for the fall as well. Um, a lot of the acorn, butternut, spaghetti, we're getting ready to plant more cucumbers and zucchini um, as well. We've only been awarded the next contract, which is eight weeks. Um, and then there's another one that's eight weeks and then another one that's eight weeks as long as the program continues. Great. Um, Andrea, I want to make sure, I, I don't know that this question got answered. Um, Tom also asked, has the administration uh, gone smoothly and have you been able to extend to the next period of boxes? Okay, yep, you did answer that, I believe. Yep. Um, okay. It's gone fairly smoothly and, and to answer your question, the produce has to be from the United States. So it just, it has to be United States grown product on that. Um, smoothly, yes, um, I'm getting much better at being invoicing. Um, it is a government system, so it does take some getting used to. I've watched the webinar multiple times to figure out how to do it, but it is, yeah, it, it's getting there. Um, still, I received another email today about something they needed, so I have to read through that, but it is, it's not too bad. So, getting better at it. Great. 
And so I had a question, Andrea, what is the timeline? So you mentioned you, you have another um, round of it. And so how, how long does that go? It is July 1st to August 31st. And then there's one September 1st to October 31st and then November 1st to December 31st. Got it. So, and we don't know, um, they let us know 15 days before the contract ends if they plan on extending us for the next one. So we don't know until, we won't know until August 15th if we get the next one. So there is risk in planting extra stuff, um, but it's something you have to decide if you're willing to take it or not. Absolutely. Um, uh, Andrea, I'm also curious. Um, I don't see any new questions in the chat box, so I'm going to go ahead and ask my question. Um, what uh, I know you've mentioned a few times in your video that demand has been really, really good for you. Um, what would you say? Um, I'm assuming that's that's a, a positive to the the whole situation, the pandemic, but what, what is something that's been more challenging as you've worked through that? Um, one of the challenges is with the, the bigger demand is the consumers, you always have the consumers that don't know what's in season, um, but it's even more so now because people are wanting to connect locally um, and you get more and more of the people that are out of touch. They don't know, you know, that asparagus doesn't grow in July. They don't realize that. So it's teaching that um, even more so than normally. Um, and a big part of the issue too is I just don't have enough to supply my customers. So, you know, some of my regular customers that are used to getting stuff, they're having to wait because I just, the demand is so high. Um, and it's, when we saw this happening in April, we planted heavy um, and we're starting to see some of the benefits now. But I... I don't know. It, it's it's going to be hard this summer because I think the demand is going to continue to increase. I know in our county right now, they are shutting things down a little bit more, even tighter, because we had some spikes this week. So I can see that going on. Um, and even this winter, I can see it, the demand increasing astronomically again because of spikes. I, I just I'm just forecasting here that I think in the winter time, you know, some of the cases are going to get worse. And it's we saw the big supply issues at the grocery stores this spring, and it's something that farmers need to plan for. I think. Absolutely, yeah. I think uh, we're hearing that from a lot of growers as well. Um, okay, we do have another question from Tom. Um, how do you figure out how to balance all of the marketing and time and Field. How do I balance my marketing and time in the field? <laughs> I don't sleep very much. Um, I have, I'm learning to delegate a lot more. Um, I myself do not spend much time in the field anymore. I have my staff do that. I try and get out to the field three to four times a week just to do a check. I do very little picking anymore. Um, and even the farmer's markets, I've turned a couple of them over to my son so that I don't travel as much for that because it was myself traveling all the time for that. Um, and that's another thing with this demand, the customers expect an instant response on Facebook. Um, and dealing with that, I'm to the point where I almost need to hire somebody just to run my social media. And I'm looking at doing some of that because we're getting ready to open our agritourism, which I should have opened it two or three weeks ago, but I can't get caught up enough to get the basic mow the grass and make it look pretty around the farm. Mm -hmm. Job done to get it done. So um, it's, I think the demand for that's going to be outrageous as well. So it's finding more staff and finding good staff's hard, um, but hiring more staff's what I need to do. I hope that answered your question, Tom. If not, let me know. And Great. Thank you. Um, let's see here. Any other questions? We still have some time. Um, Sarah, I have a question for you. Um, yeah. So you, you mentioned that the, there's a deadline on, I believe it's the PPP or the idle grant uh, for June 30th. 
but there's still a lot of money left there. Mm -hmm. Do you foresee that deadline being extended? Not sure. I was just trying to look into that today. And what I see is that there might be more legislation coming down the pipeline to figure out what to do with that money. They might decide that people who have applied already, I mean, one of the ideas is that people who already have some PPP money, PPP money can come back and get a second round of it. But I'm, I'm not sure. I'm, I imagine they'll figure out a way for that to be allocated to folks, um, but it's unclear how that will happen. It, who knows? Things, things move fast and furious in this COVID world, so things, there will probably be some more legislation shortly, so. Right. Yeah. Um, all right. Any other questions? Andrea, I'm curious um, how you think the pandemic will affect the future of local food and regional food production and marketing. Obviously, right now, we have a lot of great demand for it. Um, you know, earlier this week, we had Rick McNary, who founded Shop Kansas Farms, and that Facebook group has just exploded with folks getting connected to local producers. And I'm just curious your thoughts on, um, you know, what the world might look like when things start to become a little bit more normal. I think long run, this is going, the increased demand for local is going to continue. I don't think it's going to be as high as it is now because consumers ultimately go back to convenience and it's convenient to shop at a grocery store and pick up my meat and eggs and produce and staples all at one place. But I also see so many people buying halves and holes of animals and I don't see that changing. As I say, it's, there's going to be some that go back to the grocery store, but I think there's going to be a lot of them that never go back to the grocery store. So the demand will be higher. Same thing for produce. I, I, there's so many people. I think there's been more gardens planted by anybody this year than there ever has been before. And that just being your, back garden, your backyard gardener. And I think it's wonderful because they get to see how hard it is to grow produce. And I'm getting lots and lots of questions of what do I do with squash bugs because they can't get rid of them. So I think in the long run, it is beneficial that they planted their own garden. They get to see how hard it is and it's gonna make them appreciate local produce even more than what they do already. So I think it's gonna keep, the demand will be high, just not as high as it is right now. Yeah, I think uh, that's, I, I think I, I agree with you. I think that's something I also hear from others right now. And I hope that that will be the case and that we can continue to do what we can do to support um, the momentum that we have in supporting local farms right now. Um, all right, I am not seeing any more questions. Um, Sarah, do you have any final thoughts or just anything that you would want to make sure to share with folks before we sign off tonight? Just if you know anybody who needs money right now, who needs, you know, some some funds, some federal funds, get them to that PPP program. It's just a couple mm -hmm. of days left now, so. And um, remind me if, if folks are having trouble or need some guidance, uh, they can contact Farm Commons. Um, yeah, we are, if you go to our info box, our email, it says, you know, we are unable to assist at this time with individual inquiries. And that's because we had so many inquiries in the beginning of, of this COVID right now. But um, if there's, but yeah, I do encourage people to ask questions at this point if they have any, because that's slowed down a little bit and we are a little more available now. Absolutely. Great. And um, of course, you have some really great resources on your website um, and your podcast. So I'll be sure to link that in the follow-up uh, to folks so that they have all of that information and know where to find that info. Great. Um, yeah. Andrea, same question. Any lasting thoughts that you want to make sure folks know about your farm or what you're working on? 
No, uh, um, I am open to questions. So if anybody has questions later or needs help or anything, they're welcome to email me or give me a call and I can help them get answers. Awesome. All right, well, thank you so much. Um, like I mentioned earlier, this webinar was recorded, so it'll get sent out and we'll be linking it up on our website. So be sure to share that with anybody who may not have been able to join us tonight. We were kind of a small group, um, but I understand Thursday nights tend to be farmer's market nights. So I know a few folks are, are busy with that, much like Andrea. Um, so thank you everybody. Thank you, Sarah. Thank you, Andrea, for joining us this evening. I really appreciate it. And I know everybody appreciates your expertise as well. So um, I think we'll go ahead and, and sign off for the night. Thanks everybody. Thanks, Natalie. Thanks everyone. Thank you.